Hello, everyone. Welcome to Frameline 44. My name is Peter Stein. I'm senior programmer for the festival, and I'm very pleased you've joined us for this extended Q&A and panel discussion about the documentary Cured. And I'm especially happy that we're going to welcome a guest moderator uh, joining us for Frameline and for this conversation. Uh, I want you to welcome Stephen Canals. Uh, Stephen is a screenwriter and producer. He is best known for co-creating and executive producing the acclaimed FX television series Pose, which I'm sure you know and are a fan of like me. Uh, and interestingly, Stephen is currently developing a limited series for FX based on the documentary Cured uh, and on the podcast 81 Words. So it's a pleasure to have Stephen join us uh, for uh, to moderate the Q&A, and he's going to introduce a fantastic panel of uh, of, con of conversationalists. So welcome, Stephen Canals. Hi, Peter. Thank you for having me. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today to moderate this conversation about a wonderful documentary that I'm sure you've all just seen um, and will be on your top 10 lists um, for quite a number of years. Uh, I'm going to be joined today by the co-directors of Cured, um, Patrick Salmon is a Washington, D.C.-based filmmaker, is the creator and executive producer of Codebreaker, an award-winning drama documentary about the gay British codebreaker, Alan Turing, that reached more than 3 million viewers worldwide. Bennett Singer has been making social issue documentaries for more than 20 years. He won the DuPont Columbia Award for his work on Eyes on the Prize, a landmark PBS series on civil rights history, and with Nancy Cates, co-directed Brother Outsider, another fabulous documentary portrait of the gay civil rights activist Bayard Rustin that premiered at Sundance and won more than 20 international prizes, including the Audience Award right here at Frameline. They will be joined by Reverend Magora Kennedy, who has been fighting for social justice for more than five decades an active participant in the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and the movement for LGBTQ equality. She's a former Black Panther who describes herself as, quote, the gayest great grandmother you will ever meet. She currently resides in New York City. And finally, Gary Allender moved to the Bay Area in the late 1960s after receiving a degree in journalism from the University of Minnesota and working for several years in the peace movement in New York City. He co-founded the Berkeley chapter of the Gay Liberation Front in the fall of 1969 and participated in the first ZAP at an APA annual meeting right here in San Francisco in May of 1970. He spent his career working as a chef and today he lives in Vallejo. Thank you all for being here today. Such a pleasure to be chatting with all of you. Uh, I'm gonna dive right in. I know we don't have a lot of time and I'm gonna start with Patrick. Um, can you tell us what was the spark of inspiration for you? Why did you feel that this was a story that needed to be told? Well, about six years ago, I was looking for another documentary to dive into after I'd wrapped up the distribution efforts for Codebreaker. And a friend of mine had um, written a treatment about the life of a gay activist pioneer, Frank Kameny, and he showed me the, the treatment and it was excellent. But one of the things that jumped out at me was the story of the man in the mask and the story of Dr. Anonymous. I'd read about it in the past, but it really jumped out at me as something that could be a documentary. And so I dived more deeply into the story of the fight against the APA. And I quickly you know, decided this would make an amazing documentary. No documentary had been done about it before. So at that point, I enlisted uh, my friend and colleague, Bennett Singer. He and I had met a few years before. And so we embarked on this journey, I guess, shooting our first interview in the spring of 2015. So we're really excited to present it to audiences and we greatly appreciate that, that Frameline has, has featured it in, in this year's festival. That's wonderful. And Bennett, when Patrick reached out to you to say, I have an idea for a documentary, what, what was your reaction? Well, um, for me, I think it's, um, it was a story that that really did sort of cry out to be told. Uh, I had done a number of projects about LGBTQ history and civil rights history, um, and I felt like I knew a fair amount about the history of, of gay rights in America. Um, and yet I knew virtually nothing about this moment 
And, and um, the more I learned about it, the more I felt like, absolutely, the story needs to be told. You know, the idea that in the eyes of psychiatry and medicine, every single gay person until 1973 was automatically classified as mentally ill. And then, you know, thanks to these heroic activists um, that, that shifted and, and people were, you know, um, based on the DSM declassification cured. Uh, to me, that was just a, a really um, vitally important story and, and something that, that really deserved to be um, told. And so, as Patrick said, it took us about five years, but I'm thrilled that, that we managed to, to get it done and, and um, put together as such a um, rich collection of footage, as well as interviews with, with so many of the principal storytellers. Yeah, and we're so fortunate to, to have the both of you commit committed to telling this story you know it's something that i i know i shared with both of you um after screening it for the first time which is i really had no idea you know i think when we talk about queer history we tend to start at stonewall and don't realize that this specific you know battle with activists to overturn this definition and and within the apa it predates Stonewall. And so it's so critically important, um, especially for, I think, the younger generation um, to realize that, you know, we really do stand on the shoulders of, of giants. Um, and we're fortunate to have two of those giants here with us today. Um, so I would love to ask uh, Reverend Kennedy and, and Gary, we are honored to have the both of you here today. Thank you so much for being here. What were your first reactions to the film? Was there anything that surprised you or stood out to you as you watched this beautiful portrayal of the movement that you all lived through and participated in? Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> I, I thought, um, well, anyway, okay. One correction, no, two corrections. I always say I'm the gayest great grandmother out of the closet. Number two, I'm from the Boogie Down Bronx, originally <laughs> from Saratoga Springs, New York. <laughs> I think that I'm, I'm along with Patrick, what stood out to me was um, um, the young man in the mask. I mean, that to, you know, um, I think it stood out to me more because one of the things that happens is being a, um, um, being a minister, being in a black community, <laughs> being gay, you know, that was a good idea maybe to use a mask, but um, that was one of the things that stood out to me. I think that took tremendous courage. Mm -hmm. Gary? Yes, well, uh, I, there was a lot of information in there that I wasn't that aware of, actually. Um, the, the details of what happened behind the scenes of the APA were not that familiar to me because I was, uh, you know, we did a zap on the West Coast and we kind of, personally, I kind of left it there. It wasn't my biggest issue, although I thought it was important. Uh, we were kind of West Coast hippies and we were living our lives and we per per perhaps weren't terribly concerned about every little detail of what was going on inside the APA. But anyway, it was quite interesting uh, to see, you know, the effects of the various closeted gay people who are inside the APA and I, you know, I congratulate them in, in, in hindsight and I'm thankful for their, their activity. Amen. Go right there. <laughs> uh, Reverend Kennedy, uh, you know, one of the most electrifying moments in this film comes when you and Barbara Giddings confront David Susskind on <laughs> national television. And I'm wondering, can you take us back to that moment of resistance? What was that encounter like for you? Um, Hmm. That's a good question. I think one of the most interesting things to me, I, I, you know, I was really having fun. And I had said to Barbara, I said, look at, the, look, watch this, this man is going to, like, really, you know, try to stick it to us, you know. And so I think that that was one of the things that you know, <laughs> I found him very, very comical, really, because he was before, before we went on air, you know, he was asked to like speak to everybody. And I think he like kind of brushed past everybody and kind of waved or something. But 
to my recollection, he, he spoke, he did speak to Barbara Gettings and he just walked right on by me. So it was like, mm. you know, <laughs> um, he was very, very, I, you could see he was very nervous and very uptight. So, you know, I made a note of that in my head and I said, I hope he doesn't really go too far because I, in my mind, I'm going to let him have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what was that, what was that like? I mean, take, tell us about what it, meant for you as a black gay woman at that time to be out on television challenging what this man's argument was for homosexuality as a mental disorder well simple thing like a salmon swimming upstream <laughs> so it was tough <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was like, um, I, I got seen a lot of my uh, brothers and sisters, you know, they were in the gay community and um, uh, we were uh, like all in this fight together. But the whole thing about being black and lesbian and a minister, those three things, you know, and then mm -hmm. like going back to, the, to my particular community, um, it was you know, again, it was like swimming, a salmon swimming upstream, you know, like no matter what, I did not, it was like blinders on, and I wasn't going to let nobody to tell me, um, you know, I mean, I get people, oh, we're going to pray for you, you better pray for yourself, and then, you know, like finally, I just had it, and I said, look, let me tell all y'all, y'all don't have a heaven or hell to put me in, so please get out of my face. Mm. But in that the, was quote from Reverend Troy Perry, though, originally. <laughs> in the film, you talk about being uh, a young wife uh, and eventually a divorcee and then a mom. And so I'm curious for you as a lesbian mother, were you ever fearful or did you feel that you were at risk of losing your children or having your custody rights challenged because of your appearance on Suskind's program? Um, no, what had happened, um, it was, uh, my mother who was very, very ashamed of me. Um, and I got married, uh, well, you know, she signed papers for me to get married at 14 years of age, which again was illegal in the state of New York, you know, up in Saratoga Springs, New York. And, um, I don't know, like I, the best thing I can do, I felt betrayed. That's, I guess that's the mm -hmm. best way to put it. And after that, there was like anger galore. One of the things that I learned from friends of mine who had had children and had been married was not to put the father's name on the birth certificate because that would be one of the reasons why I'd seen a lot of my friends' children get snatched that way. Not that they cared a damn thing about the, excuse the expression, damn thing about the kids. It was just the idea of getting even with, um, you know, like how dare you, woman, <laughs> you know, type right. thing. Yeah. Wow. So there was certainly was some some fear, some risk then at that time for you. Yeah, because when I had my children, I absolutely refused. I didn't even put my husband's name on the birth certificate. I have nobody's name <laughs> when I had those five boys now. And did you feel that you had because of because obviously there was community that was being built around this shared movement for liberation. And so despite the fact that you may not have had support with your family, did you feel that you did with, with your chosen family, the other LGBTQ members who you were surrounded yes. by? Yes, yes. Yeah, um, it was like, like having, like I said, having had been in, um, in the Black Panther Party, having been in the civil rights movement, having been on voter registration drives, when I heard about Stonewall, to me, this was like coming home, fighting everybody else's fight, my fight now. Mm -hmm. I have one more question for you, which is, yeah. what, was the, uh, what was the intersection of those two movements like? Because obviously, you know, even today, we tend to separate identity, you know, so we have a really hard time understanding that an LGBTQ person can also be Black or can also be Latinx. Um, and so you find, especially today, there's a, with, 
with millennials, you see a lot of code switching, depending on what space I'm in, a particular identity will be up front and center. Okay, baby, wait a minute, back up, honey. Mother's 81 years old. What is code switching? What does that mean? <laughs> Meaning if I'm around other gay people, <laughs> then being gay will be up front and center versus if I'm around other folks of color, then that's the identity that's up front and center. And so oh. I'm wondering for you, as someone who obviously was both black and lesbian, and you were part of the LGBT movement, and you were part of the Black Panther movement, was there any intersecting of these two movements for you as a member of both? Well, I think that most of the things that happened, like I think um, the two people, um, Alan Roscoff and Jim Owls. Jim Owls organized the very first um, march that went from the village up to, um, up to the sheep meadow. The thing was that most of these people like Jim Owls, Alan Roscoff, these people had been in like either Communist Party or Socialist Workers Party. The people were being thrown out of these so-called socialist uh, things because they were gay. Same thing was with Chuck going on in the Black Panther Party. Um, mm -hmm. I was in the Boston chapter, Boston New Haven chapter of Black Panther Party. And I'm like, you ain't kicking me out of no place. Me and my kids, we leaving. You know, and they were like begging me not to go and whatnot. But no, me and my sons, we left. We didn't, we didn't get kicked out of the party. But this is what was going on at the time. People were getting kicked out of Black Panthers because they were gay, Socialist Worker Party because they were gay, Communist Party because they were gay. So, wow. You know, yeah. Wow. Um, I, have a, I wanna ask you a question, Gary, which is um, you participated in, in the APA annual meeting in 1970, the, the zap that occurred. Um, but before we get there, I want to ask you about, you founded the Berkeley chapter, co-founded the Berkeley chapter of the Gay Liberation Front in the fall of 1969. Um, and I'm curious, um, what role did Stonewall play in the creation of that Berkeley chapter, if at all? Well, yeah, Stonewall uh, was the inspiration for that particular movement at that particular time. Um, it was, we were called the Berkeley Gay Liberation Front because the first uh, organization founded after Stonewall directly as a result of Stonewall, they called themselves the Gay Liberation Front in New York. So um, some of us were vaguely in contact with some of the people in New York. And so that was that was, uh, you know, it was inspired by, the, of course, the uh, liberation, the liberation front of the Vietnamese who were fighting the Americans in Vietnam at the time. Yeah. And can you tell us more about that zap that you participated in in 1970 at the APA annual meeting in San Francisco? Yeah, well, uh, we had been organized about six, seven, eight, nine months at that point and had done a a few other, you know, we'd done other events, some cultural events, um, a series of meetings. We'd had a sort of a symposium over a weekend in, uh, in over the winter of that year in, in Berkeley. We had a s small um, center that we shared with uh, some, uh, some women's groups just across the street from the campus on Bancroft Way. It was actually uh, a former uh, Methodist church uh, we were kicked out of there eventually because we're a little too radical. But for about a year, we, we, had, a, we had the a privilege of using that center space. So we organized that. And there was also uh, people in San Francisco who by that time had started the Gay Liberation Front in San Francisco. So um, these two of us, you have to understand these organizations were very loosely organized. I mean, there was no president, vice president, no treasurer, nothing like that. So. Uh, we had heard that the APA was coming to San Francisco, and we just thought, well, we can't let that go by without without our, our response, without sticking our you know our words in, into it. And and uh, you know we had a lot of energy around that because you know it was just too good and just too good a possibility to pass up. And uh, as a young gay man, I had uh, you know as a young closeted gay man at the University of Minnesota, I'd gone into the stacks of their library, which had millions of books, and there were like twelve or fifteen books on homosexuality there. And some of those onerous books were written by the people who were appearing at this APA convention. And I thought, well, <laughs> what, what fun will this be, you know, to confront some of these guys? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was. <laughs> it turned out to be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, quite, you know, it was one of the more unforgettable days of my life, actually. Wow. And obviously, that must have been a really powerful moment for you as a, as a young gay man to confront your enemies in that way. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about how that action tied into some of the broader goals that you had as a member of the GLF? Well, our, our, our fundamental, uh, I think our fundamental uh, attitude was what we really had to do was change the inner belief and thinking of gay people ourselves. Because uh, we uh, obviously had grown up in a culture which taught us all kinds of negative things about ourselves. And uh, the fundamental thing was to get rid of those and to get a positive identity around being gay and about everything else. Because of course, if you have a negative attitude about your sexuality, that you have a negative at attitude about yourself in general, really. So uh, fundamentally, you know, gay is good was the first button I wore. Doesn't that sound terribly bland? <laughs> At the time, it was pretty revolutionary, you know. Yes. <laughs> Everybody thought gay was bad. I mean, you know, gay is good. Really? How could that possibly be? You know, and uh, first of all, we had to convince ourselves, really, you know. And, uh, but, it, we, you know, it was a very mutually supportive situation. We had consciousness raising groups and we were in, you know, in constant dialogue with each other. And... It was, you know, it was a very intense, fast moving part of my life. It was one I couldn't sustain for very long because it was just, it was almost too much. I mean, it was drug, sex, rock and roll and politics all rolled into one. <laughs> That's what life was like in the Bay Area in the late 60s and early 70s. So it was uh, a very intense time. I mean, I just, you know, it's not, a, not that kind of intensity you can't sustain for a lifetime. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> I had an opportunity to read the article that you wrote, Gay Liberation Meets the Shrinks, uh, which was published in 1970. Um, and I have a, a, a couple questions about that. One is, you know, you obviously you have a journalism degree and uh, the, the article that you wrote is such a vivid recounting of the experience. Um, as you put it, quote, walking into the enemy's inner sanctum. Right. Um, so I'm curious now, reflecting back on that experience. Um, did you walking in to that APA convention believe truly that that moment was going to bring about lasting change? Um, no, I don't think we had that belief. Um, we just, you know, we're going on our instincts of what to do and what to say. Um, the fact that change in that regard came as fast as it did, I think was a surprise to us. Um, we were prepared to go on with the shrinks going on just as they were because our attitude was, well, we know what's right. We know what we believe. We know who we are. Uh, we don't need them to valid validate us and, you know, and cure us really <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, we're in the process of being cured our, on our own, you know. Um, so, uh, but, you know, we had, we, uh, at least speaking for myself, I didn't know much about what was going on. And I knew nothing really about what was going on internally in the APA. I assumed there were gay people in the APA because there are gay people everywhere. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I really, I've never had an encounter actually with uh, the, the psychiatric profession myself and uh, at that point. And uh, so I didn't know much about what was going on there. But uh, I, I think we were surprised when, when it was overturned as relatively quickly as it was. Wow. Well, we're thankful for your work. And I, I want to ask you, there's, um, and this question is for both you and for Reverend Kennedy. Um, in the same article, uh, you talk about your conversations with uh, shrinks, as you call them in the piece. And you say that there was a small minority of them who felt that homosexuality fell within the, quote, range of normality. Um, and there's a something I think is really powerful um, that you write. You say that one of our replies was always, well, why don't you tell the world? Silence is also a crime. Uh, and that I have goosebumps just reading that out loud. And I, I'm wondering if you and, and Reverend Kennedy can talk about the present day fight for LGBTQ liberation and sort of connecting what happened in the late 60s and early 70s to the broader movements that we're seeing today, um, you know, and this notion of being silent, because obviously there was no silence then, and uh, using our voices is still so critically important now. Um, do you, are you emboldened by, are you inspired by the current generation of activists? Are there certain things that you think we could be saying louder 
where do you feel we sort of are right now in the movement? Well, um, I, you know, the movement is just so complex now compared to uh, what it was in the early days. Our, our, it, maybe it, it was always complex, but the complexity has been revealed, shall we say. And it's so diverse that, I, you know, I, um, I'm inspired by the people of Hong Kong, for example. I mean, I just think they're heroic and, uh, you know, and I'm also inspired by, of course, uh, Black Lives Matter. I mean, of course, Black Lives Matter. I mean, does that need to be said still in the 21st century? Yes, it oh, does. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. But, uh, you know, uh, say it loud. I mean, gay and, gay and proud and, and everybody else too. Uh, you know, and, and also we all, all of us share a common identity too. We should never forget that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, in this day and time, see, the whole thing is about um, Black Lives Matter, if I can digress a minute. You go back to 1619, okay? This is when Africans were first brought to um, this side of the continent. 1619 to 2020, that's 401 years of indoctrination and slavery and being and being um, called three-fifths of a human, uh, women and men being bred for slavery, and then finally the fight to keep human beings as slaves, the Confederacy. So yeah, Black Lives Matter, you better believe your sweet bippy <laughs> Black Lives really matter. We've been here over 401 years. My ancestors, both Native American, I'm part Native American and Caribbean, my ancestors built this country. If there was not for us, there would be no them, you, me either. So that's where I'm at on that. Amen. <laughs> Another thing is that to see the movements working together to me is very exciting. Having come from an era where, you know, you had to be either with the gay community, you had to either be with the women's movement, you had to be this, you had to be that, but not everybody working together. I think that this, for me, is one of the greatest things to see these movements still protesting and working together. One more thing, back here on the wall, you'll see, I got, I got, I received this as a gift in uh, 20, um, when Stonewall was 25 years old, they gave me a flag, you know, for, <laughs> for being a gay rights pioneer. And then also I received this crown uh, from the Imperial, um, Imperial, I forgot, well, anyway, I got the crown then for 25. <clears throat> and then, and uh, for 50 years, I got a banner, you know, a rainbow banner. So, <laughs> <laughs> so those, you know, those things that I'm very, very proud of <clears throat> and the fact that how far we have come. And I think it's wonderful. <clears throat> and as I always say, we started it, you youngins finish it. <laughs> <laughs> and finish it, we shall. <laughs> All right. We must, we must. Yes. Um, I'm curious for, for Patrick and for Bennett, I want to talk a little bit about the production process. And, you know, one of the things I, that uh, I was so struck by with, with Cured is that unlike many historical documentaries, um, you didn't choose to include the voices of historians or a narrator. Um, so why did you choose to tell the story as you did? Well, I could jump in on, on that. Um... I think for us, um, we, we had this goal um, that the film would be more immediate and would be more alive and would be more authentic if we could tell the story without a narrator, but also without um, experts telling people what to think or why things mattered. You know, there was a slogan actually that you see um, in a, a placard that Barbara Giddings and other people are, are carrying. Um, that was used by the activists at the time of the DSM fight saying, we are the experts on our lives. And part of our decision was, or our, our goal was, you know, these activists were the, indeed the experts on their lives, but they're also the experts on this history. And so while we did have a whole board of historians and consultants working with us and guiding us um, behind the scenes, we, we really wanted to, um, to keep the film as, as sort of immediate as we could. And we, 
this was a rule or a sort of a, a style that we had also used in um, the Bayard Rustin film, as well as back in Eyes on the Prize, which I had the privilege of working on. You know, the only people you heard from were people who were witnesses. And I do think that brings a different sense of immediacy to the to the storytelling. I should also say our editor, Steve Hefner, really pushed us, encouraged us, and, and sort of made, made, you know, helped us make that possible because we, we did think that maybe expert voices in certain places would be necessary, but with, with Steve's sort of encouragement and, um, and with the amazing interviews that, that came through um, from the folks we're with today, as well as the other um, people in the film, it, it became possible to, to really um, stick with that, that style. Mm -hmm. And the film that has a, there's just such a wealth, a plethora of really beautiful archival footage and archival materials. And I'm curious, um, again, for you and for Patrick, what were some of the surprises or some of the discoveries that you made during the course of your research? Well, it was quite a long journey to sort of discover all the elements. There were literally dozens of sources for the archival material. And we had a great team of archival um, researchers uh, Luan Jones and Murdu Chandra really led the way in, in identifying material. And then we were fortunate enough to visit, ben, ben and I visited about 10 or 12 different uh, research places, uh, sometimes together, sometimes one or the other of us. And it takes sometimes, not everything's online. You have to go to a place, you have to look through boxes. And the real amazing uh, discovery was we were at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia looking through the collection that John Fryer, after he was after he died, 217 boxes, and Bennett in a in a box labeled miscellaneous audio. He was listening through each of the tapes, and he discovered the audio from the uh, 1972 discussion in Dallas, where you hear John Fryer, Doctor Anonymous, pleading to his fellow psychiatrist to remove homosexuality from the DSM. So that really came to life. And that was probably the highlight. We had a number of other discoveries like that, but that one certainly uh, takes the cake and it really brings the, brings the film to life, that discovery we made. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that, you know, I'm usually pretty well behaved in libraries, but I think in, in that moment I, I um, can be forgiven for my outburst. Of, oh my God, like that really was like electrifying. And similarly, I'll say like, you know, um, as, as Patrick mentioned, our amazing archival producers brought in the, the raw footage of the Susskind show. And um, of course I was you know, riveted by the entire panel, but there, you know, there was Reverend Kennedy in this footage. And it was based on that, that we sort of worked backwards and tried to f find out like, could we possibly connect with this activist and how do we find her? And I looked online and miraculously enough, you know, there was a Stonewall Veterans website with the bio of Reverend Kennedy. And then we managed to find a phone number or an email address. And it was a bit of a, process but you know i'm so so grateful that we managed to connect and i will say that everywhere we possibly could in terms of the filmmaking we juxtaposed archival moments from 50 years ago with present day interviews of, of our storytellers and we had that 60 minutes piece too which i don't think has been seen since it originally aired in 1973 and two of our storytellers ronald gold um, and charles silverstein are featured in that um, 1973 segment and we were fortunate enough to, to interview both of them. Ronald Gold has, has since died, um, and, and which really underscores you know, the urgency of, of, of doing these interviews and chronicling this history. Um, but I'm excited and, and really grateful that we were able to put that kind of storytelling together. Um, and I just think there's something so moving about having people look back at their younger selves and think about <laughs> you know, where was this movement before it was really fully a movement in like 1969 and 70 and 71 and as Gary said the the DSM story and 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 process really did Im evolve in such a relatively fast way um, and how did that happen and what was going on inside and outside the APA I'm just and even hearing this conversation I, I just, it's just very moving to me and, and just so inspiring about where we've been but also where we're going. Yeah. 
I, I've said this to you before, but the I've watched Cured about it might be I think twelve times now. I've, I've seen it quite a bit, and and every time that I, you know, am reinvested in this story in this journey, um, I always have new takeaways and new aha moments. And so I know for everyone who is joining us right now on Frameline um, that they're eager to screen Cured again. And I highly encourage everyone who's watching to do that because I think it is a film that continues to have new gifts. And, and uh, I'm curious for uh, Patrick and for Bennett, what are the plans for distributing Cured? Um, how can people uh, screen it again if they're interested? Where can they find it? Yeah, well, well CuredDocumentary.com is the website and we'll continue updating uh, our distribution plans, but we're going to be in a bunch of other festivals this fall around the country and around the community screenings uh, starting in uh, in early next year uh, with various organizations and then eventually it'll be on PBS next fall. So we're excited to reach this uh, as large an audience as possible and then we have plans as well to distribute it around the world. And Stephen, I know we're tight on time, but I feel like people would would feel like we were remiss if we didn't ask you to talk briefly about your interest in the story from a fictional scripted point of view. And if you would say a few words about the the series that you're developing and, and why you felt, you know, the motivation to, to option cured and 81 words. Um, I think people would be fascinated to hear about that as the next step in your career following Pose. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think as I, I noted earlier when I was talking to Reverend Kennedy, uh, you know, we as a as LGBTQ people, as a community, uh, often have to seek out our history. You know, our history, our narratives are not taught in curriculums. Um, and my, my knowledge, my understanding of the LGBTQ movement, I realize, always began in 1969 with Stonewall. Um, and what I was so moved by when hearing about this fight for liberation that again predates the, the Stonewall riot is that, uh, that there were all these incredible men and women and non-binary individuals who were part of this collection in this fight for liberation. Um, and we continue to fight for liberation to this day. And so I think thinking about the up and coming generation, the importance of recognizing that we truly stand in the shadows of all of these giants um, who fought for us so that we can, we can be out and we can be proud. Um, you know, we don't uh, have to hide in corners anymore. Um, but I also wanted to craft a narrative similar to what I'm doing with Pose as a way to say thank you to all the individuals who were on the front line, who were doing the work then and continue to use their voices and do the work now. You know, I think uh, whether it's uh, Don Kilhefner, who we had an opportunity to talk to a few weeks back, Reverend Kennedy and Gary, um, you know, we, I benefit from the work that you all did. And I recognize that. And so I think in many ways, adapting Cured is as much wanting our history. Uh, and I feel this way about Cured as well. It's as much about having an, a historical document, something that says we were here, this is the work that we did, as much as it is just a way to say, thank you, thank you for the work. You know, we see you and we affirm that. Um, you know, you won't be forgotten. Thank you for the contribution. Uh, I'd just like to add one more thing. Um, here, I'm doing a self-plug. <laughs> uh, I wrote a book, I, and, and in the process of getting published, called Shades of Stonewall, which tells, like, I'm, uh, I'm giving my eyewitness view from being out there that Saturday night, and from what was told to me that happened that Friday night. So from that Friday night until that Monday, we were in the street. But um, over the years, of course, as the 50 years evolved, you know, less people, those of us that were out there got less, um, you know, uh, recognition of, for what we did, as well as like Gary out there in California, to be, you know, it was like, okay, this was it. It was just like spur of the moment thing to a certain extent. 
But yet and still, that weekend, it was mostly people of color. So I'm writing a book called Shades of Stonewall. Hope to have it out by Stonewall by um, June. <laughs> Incredible. Well, we will be looking for that. Uh, also, I did find a banner. This is, what I, this is what I got presented with in uh, for 50 years. They gave me, finally gave me a sash. So I have the Stonewall 25. I have my crown and I have this <laughs> for the 50 years of the work. <laughs> oh. I'm jealous. I didn't have neither a crown nor a sash. Oh. <laughs> you got to do something about that. Yes. <laughs> really. We're yeah. going to send, send you one, one from the Cure team. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so that, much. Um, we... Just one more thing from a religious point, California. When we were out here, um, I think I said this to you before, but I think it really uh, bears because East Coast, West Coast, East Coast, here we are out here in the streets in Greenwich Village uh, on Christopher Street, the Stonewall Inn. West Coast, uh, Reverend Troy D. Perry was starting Metropolitan Community Church for uh, people in the life, you know, and then along with people like Gary and whatnot. So there to me was like there was a spirit going on that had descended and it was time for it to come out and be open. Wow. I mean, that's my feeling. <laughs> Amazing. Sadly, we are all out of time. I, <laughs> we, we could do this for another hour. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, thank you, Gary and Reverend Kennedy for not only being guests today, but thank you for all of your work. Thank you for your continued efforts. We appreciate you. Um, thank you to Patrick and Bennett for crafting a beautiful documentary. Again, everyone at home, I encourage you to uh, follow Cured. There's an Instagram page, there's a Facebook page, there's a Twitter account um, so that you can continue to find this doc. And as I noted, watch it, you know, and continue to have takeaways and and be moved by this really beautiful narrative so thank you all for being here today um, thank you thank you for having us, us. And thank, thank you patrick and 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 stephen and bennett especially you know for as they said well, reverend jackson said keep it hope alive <laughs> <laughs> thank you and thank you to frameline for um <laughs> featuring the film and for being yes. such an amazing um, and a piece of our history as well. Yes, yes. Thank you all. 